Greetings, Sim Captains, and welcome to our FMC setup video. Today we are on board a United Zebo 737-800 at San Francisco. We're going to set this flight up to LAX, which was a viewer request. So let's jump inside. At this point, we're going to assume you have started most of the pre-flight setup and we have another video if you haven't already seen that to get you that far so at this point we are on ground power and our IRS is aligning up there and I accidentally disconnected the ground power earlier so I hope it's going to continue aligning and if not I will have learned a new way to fault the Zebo today so Move your view to the FMC and we're going to start working our way through this. I'm going to pause here for a moment because we're going to put up an image with about four items you will need to finish this, four pieces of information. had a second to check that list out. If you don't have all of that information at the moment, don't worry, you'll have some time to go and find it. So we're going to start working through the way the uh, FMC wants to be set up. This is pretty much the normal start screen. You can see FMC and A cars are listed. The FMC is going to take us into the flight management computer. That's where you really want to be for setup. And ACARS is a separate feature that would allow the aircraft to communicate with its own company uh, using this display system. Zebo has put in there a way you can use this ACARS function to get the METAR, which is basically the weather report, from pretty much any location, which is fairly neat because you can pull up the uh, METAR in advance of an airport rather than just waiting until you're within radio range to pick up their broadcasted um, weather. So, first thing we're going to do here is take note of this bottom line. It says enter IRS position. That is related to what's going on upstairs here on the overhead. When you started up the aircraft and you set your IRS knobs to nav and it began aligning its gyros. Um, the aircraft is waiting to position itself. So the IRS is going to track movement and the FMC needs to tell it where we are starting from. So first let's click the soft key on the left hand side, number one. And you'll see we are now into sort of a operating system menu. There's not much you really need to deal with in here. And actually while I'm thinking of it, let's go to the bottom left hand corner of the keypad for clear. Anytime you have a message there, you're going to need to clear it out. If there's multiple messages, they'll kind of stack up. As you clear one, you'll see the next. Alright, uh, we've got some data here. Nothing super important that we need to see at the moment. So the first function we're going to do is to initialize our position. So you see here P-O-S-I-N-I-T. Click the right hand uh, bottom soft key, because that would be number six. And this is probably familiar from our other video. We need to initialize where we are via the GPS. So first thing I'm going to do is go down here above the number pad. We have a previous and a next page. If you look up in the top of the display window, you'll see in the top right hand corner if there are other pages. We are on page one of three. So let's scroll through using next page. Page two has the GPS. You can see the IRS positions are blank. If we are in flight, those should reflect where each IRS thinks we are at. Uh, and you can see page three actually doesn't come up. That's interesting. 
So from page two, we want to grab one of these GPS positions by clicking a soft key to the left. Uh, they should both match. If they didn't, you probably have an issue that needs to be resolved by maintenance. In the simulator, I've never seen that happen. So today I'm going to use uh, GPS right. I'm going to click the fifth left hand soft key. And you'll see all the data pops in here. It automatically fills. So uh, don't try and type that in. You're wasting your time. Once that's there, you're going to click previous page and then to the right hand side of these little squares for set IRS position you'll click what is this the fourth right hand soft key and it's going to grab everything out of that bar and stick it there and now you can see we are aligned um, so we have a position input the FMC theory knows where it is this is not really required but it would actually be done. So we are going to input where we are. We are at K S F O. That was your uh, origin ICAO code, the four letter. Uh, when you're flying as a passenger, you'll see it just referred to as S F O. Uh, in the United States, pretty much all airport prefixes begin with a K, with the exception of maybe small private airstrips. Um, outside the United States it's a little more spotty they don't always line up as nicely you know in the US you can pretty much take your passenger code and stick a K in front fairly safely once you leave the United States it doesn't work that easily alright next thing we're going to do we've set up our position so the FMC is now ready to deal with the route and you can see its logic after we've completed the position is to suggest this to us. Route is down here in the bottom of the display so we can use the soft key and you can actually always jump to it. It has its own shortcut key in the keyboard here RTE for route. But we're going to go through the menus today the way sort of the logic of the FMC programming was set up. So let's click route. You may notice down here in our input bar of the window we have KSFO pre-filled. I have not retyped that. It's one of the little bonuses of doing this the way the FMC wants. It's pre-filled. Why is it pre-filled? So you can go up here to origin, click the first soft key, and it will populate. If for some reason it wasn't there, you would just type in KSFO and click it there. We need a destination, and we were requested to do a flight to LAX, so we'll put in K L A X. Click the soft key to the right, and there it is. If you're flying simulating airline operations here, you can put in a airline code and flight number. This doesn't really affect anything, but it's nice to have it in there. We don't need to use company route. Uh, that, that has more to do with the saving features, and I'm not going to handle this right now. Quite honestly, I never save a route in here. The um, nav data changes about every 30 days from Navigraph, and there's just, to my mind, no reason to save routes that will be out of date. And I tend to like variety. I very rarely fly the same routes. Uh, runway, that's going to populate later when we set up our departure. So we're going to leave that alone for now. So down here you can see the next thing the FMC logic wants to set up is perf init, performance initialization. So click that bottom right hand key. Okay, a number of important things to do on this page and back to that little pre-flight information list I showed you earlier. Uh, item number three is a takeoff weight. So we are going to grab that from the onboard avatab from our electronic flight bag or EFB. That's this little iPad guy on your left or tablet or whatever it is. The ones I'm used to seeing have been iPads. Our takeoff weight is going to be in this weight and balance menu in the top right. So click weight and balance. Takeoff weight is abbreviated here as TOW, T-O-W. And you can see it is 64.3. And that's 64.3 thousand. Oh, we're in kilograms. Well, let's get out of that. 
going to learn something new here briefly. Click home. Third in on the bottom row is settings. Uh, we've got aircraft configuration in the bottom left. Global units. Let's switch this over to pounds. Every time you switch liveries in the Zebo, its configuration will be saved. So the avatab, for example, uh, on every livery I have flown already is already set to pounds because that's what I prefer to use. On this livery, which I have not been using, it defaults to kilograms. All right, we've gone back to our weight menu. You can now see our takeoff weight is 141.7 pounds. And a kilo is about 2.2 .2 pounds anyway, so it's, it's roughly double. But we do want an accurate number. So 141.7. We will input that here for our gross weight. So 141.7. Click the soft key, and it populates. Uh, we can skip the plan. Fuel, zero fuel weight. It takes care of itself. Don't mess with that. The reserve weight is going to come off of your SIM briefing. So if you're using SIM brief, it's going to have a set reserve. If you're not using SIM brief and you're just kind of fudging this, um, the way it works out, it seems like just about every flight is going to want around 2,000 to uh, 2,500 thousand pounds of fuel extra. So you could be fairly safe just putting in here 2.5. If you set that number too high, you will have an issue where it might tell you you have insufficient fuel. And you might have plenty of fuel for the flight. What it really means is if you set this reserve, let's say I put 10 in there, it will have calculated that at the cruise altitude and the distance you're going, you will have gone into your reserve. And that is really what it's alerting you to. Uh, so if you ever put in fuel numbers that you know are good and should work for it, just check that you didn't accidentally set the reserve to something ridiculous. All right, I'm going to pause here for a moment because we want to take a moment to look at the first page of the briefing because that actually has much of this data. Now that you've had a moment to look at the brief, you'll notice uh, a couple of the items were highlighted there, and we are going to need most of them on this page. On the top right hand corner of that first page of the brief, and by the way the brief was I think 32 pages, but uh, it's very in depth and most of the basic information you need is about the first three pages, but in the top right was CI beside CRZ SYS and that's a cost index and basically you can sort of think of this as like gas mileage. The higher the cost index the more fuel we are willing to burn. The lower the cost index uh, the more likely you are to be on a low cost carrier cruising along extra slow to save on burn. This flight was calculated at a cost index of 10, which is obviously on the low side of a system of 100. So we'll put in 10, and that will help the FMC to calculate speeds, and it's also obviously going to change our flight time uh, if it sets us to a lower cruise speed. Okay, you can see up here these squares. Um, the squares are indicating something we can't really live without, and the dotted lines are things that are a little more optional. But up here we need a cruise altitude. Uh, you can set this on more than one location, but we're going to set it here on this page while it's busy asking for it. On that brief was a line that said FL steps KSFO 0350. Uh, 
we're not really stepping up to any different altitude, so we're going to be cruising at flight level 350, which is 35,000 feet. So you could type in 35,000 or just put 350 because the computer knows that's what it will be. So we have 350, click the soft key, there it is. Uh, cruise and wind, this is an average winds at altitude. It was on the list under the cost index, about four down. I'm going to put it in because I'm a creature of habit. I always put it in. 276 at 041, that's the average winds there. And that would just help the computer to more accurately calculate uh, its fuel burn. For example, if we were flying a course into a headwind, that would affect what the estimated fuel burn would be, etc. You also notice uh, once we got enough data in here, a yellow light came on here above this execute key. That basically means we've input data that is not active yet. So we need to click execute and everything we have put in will then become active in the system. There we go. And you can see up in the top left, ACT has now been activated. Now shame on me, I did skip something earlier that we should go back for. Do you remember before we got to this page, we were doing the route. We're going to use this route key here to jump back. We had put in our origin, our destination, a flight number, and I babbled a bit about runway and company route. What we didn't actually do was put in our routing yet. So you'll notice here we're on page one of two. Let's use that next page button down here above the number pad. You can see a blank page here. The left is via and the right is to. Um, the right hand side will be waypoints, navigational beacons or GPS fixes. The left is airways, jetways, basically routing. So if you were doing street navigation, you know, two might be a cross street or an intersection, a fixed point, and via might be the name of a highway or something. And this helps the computer to know where we're going and what waypoints. So you might only input uh, two things on the two and one via, and then when later when we go to our legs page, you might find it is filled in five or ten separate waypoints that were on the via on the jetway that you didn't even have to type in so always like extra efficiency at this point before we can actually put in our routing I want to give you one little tidbit you have to have a minimum of one waypoint so if you just want to jump in the Zebo and you want everything up and working you need to put in an origin and a destination airport and pick one waypoint and then the FMC will be happy. You might not be pleased you're ignoring it if you're just going to hand fly but it will help get all the systems up and running so you'll need at least one waypoint. Let's take a moment to look at our routing uh, on Sky Vector so we'll get a nice map as well as we'll see the waypoints. vector routing you might have seen in that white box we had four codes identified the first one ended with a number it was five letters and a number that is actually the name of our departure as a SID a standard instrument departure out of San Francisco and the last one on there was five letters and then a number that is a star a standard arrival into LAX so we really only had two waypoints in here and there was no via to use there's no airway the jetway 
Uh, it's going to be jetways, by the way, at the altitude we'll be flying here. And so the first one is called eBay. These are all meant to be pronounceable. They are GPS spots. There's nothing on the ground transmitting this. So we type it in and we click 2. You'll see in the VIA it says direct, meaning we are not traveling any preset air route in the sky. We are just flying direct from where we are to that point. Our next one is Burgle. B-U-R-G-L. And we hit two. All right, at this point, we have our two fixes, and we can hit activate. Now execute is live, so we hit execute, and it is in. Um, let's go back to that route page. Now might not be a terrible time to set up our departure, since we were just looking at that uh, that SID code which was, I guess you'd say this is Sahay 3, S-A-H-E-Y 3. So we're going to click this Departure Arrival button. You can see at the top line we have Departure on the left, Arrivals on the right. And LAX does not have a departure. That's because we're not leaving LAX, we're just leaving SFO. If you're wondering why it has an Arrival button, that's if you wanted to set up a arrival route in the case of a engine failure or some sort of need to return to SFO so that's more of a contingency arrangement so we're going to click the departure soft key by SFO on this list on the left we're looking for Sahay 3 now I do not see it so I'm going to click this next page button ah there it is third one down we click it and you notice the runways available has been reduced because only certain runways actually work with this departure and the transition is going to be a waypoint that takes you basically out of this standard departure plan and into your flight plan so you would want to look at the uh, charts on Navigraph to see which one of these was the most sensible for you. And at this point I need to take a peek at the brief and see what our departure runway is. One of the benefits of using SimBrief is all of this work is done for you. If you were to plan the flight out fully yourself, it's doable if you don't have uh, SimBrief, and SimBrief is free so I don't know why you wouldn't bother, but it would take you a little bit of time to find a logical course, check the weather, find the appropriate runway, make sure the runway is appropriate for your aircraft and the weight you're using. Alright, we're going to be departing runway 10 left. So we'll click that soft key. Alright, you'll see they're both selected SEL, but it's not active yet. Once again, this execute key has a yellow light, so we'll click execute. And now you can see it went from select to active ACT. All right, I'm not going to use. Oh, actually, I am going to use this transition. I see eBay. That was our waypoint. Let execute. There we go. I just feel like taking a peek to see how that all came out. So let's go to route. You notice the runway has been populated now. We didn't have to type it in here. And. Let's click legs. I just want to take a peek. The legs is going to show you every step of the route. You can see on the left hand side all of the waypoints. You can see the heading you would be traveling from one waypoint to the next. You can see distances of each leg to the next waypoint. You can see these are very short because we're in the uh, departure. It's extremely close together. And then the last thing on the right is the altitudes. And these are pretty much set altitudes that are not coming out of the FMC because they're logical for your flight. They're coming out of the departure procedures. This is to help keep all the traffic properly separated and flowing. So we have uh, some that have an A. That's for, um, I believe, above. 
goes above, below, and at altitudes. Those are your indications. And so I use the next page button, and then you can see the rest of our trip is farther apart, and we're at our cruise altitude. You also notice the trip just sort of terminates here at Burgle. We have not set up an arrival yet, and I'm going to wait on that because we'll save that for when we are actually getting close to LAX. Uh, we could do it now, but in reality, on the way into LAX, we might be rerouted for any number of reasons, or the weather could change, and a runaway might switch, so I'm not going to put in the work now when it might change later. Okay, I'm going to go back to route, so we're basically where we started. I used the hotkey here in the bottom, and going through its sort of logic buttons, see takeoff and the display. Let's go to takeoff. Takeoff reference. Uh, you can see we've got squares under flaps, so it definitely wants to know that. Some of the other things we don't have to use, but we will. Flaps 5 is pretty normal for the 737, so we're going to put 5. You might also have flaps 10 under certain conditions. All right, uh, next, CG. We can get the CG the same place we got our weight. We'll go back to our electronic flight bag. I'm still on that weight menu, and you'll see at the bottom TO CG for takeoff CG. It's at 22%. So we're going to input that here, 22. And we get a trim number, 5.06. Your trim wheel is located here to the left of the throttle quadrant. And you'll see now we're somewhere, well, it's above visually, but numerically we are below 5, so it would maybe call that 4.9 right now, and they'd like us to be at 5.6. So let's adjust the trim. Let's call that 5.6. Uh, it's, the green band is the takeoff band. The main thing is if your trim was set really high and you had a very lightweight aircraft, for example, we have not that much fuel on board right now compared to the max takeoff, then when you reach your uh, V2, the airplane could just come peeling off the ground and you don't want to over-rotate and tail strike the aircraft because your trim was out of balance. Uh, on the other side, you don't want your trim set so low that you're having to use a tremendous amount of input on your yoke just to try and get your nose off the ground. All right, looking back on here, we put in our flaps, we put our CG, we set our trim. You can see that we've got runway data. We selected runway 10 left. You have the distance in feet and meters, and you would use that with the weight to check if you're operating safely with the winds, etc., etc. And let's get down to a feature I really like in the Zebo. We have a V speed calculator here. Let's see. Ah! We have forgotten something. Um, this QRH should be showing us suggested V1, V2, V rotate and it is not, meaning I have skipped something. So let's go back here to index. Let's go to performance, perf. Earlier when I realized we hadn't done our routing, I jumped us back and we skipped something going through the logic of this. So earlier we had route and then take off. Oh, sorry route took us not to take off since we've already set it it's being cranky to performance and then after we put in our weights and performance we should have gone to this N1 limit alright N1 is here that's the speed of the outer frontmost fan on the engines the one thing we really need to get in here is the outside air temperature, and the thing you're the most likely to mess up is forgetting to put this slash first. 
if you don't put in the slash, whatever number you input is going to go on the left hand side and it's not going to calculate correctly. So come down here, first put in this little slash, and then let's go find the outside air temperature. We can take this total air temperature reading, which is really not the way you're supposed to do it, sort of kind of like reading your car's uh, indication of the outside air temperature. It's always a little messed up because your vehicle's sitting in the sun or whatnot and it's not really true to the air temperature. That said, in the Zebo, this pretty much always matches what you're going to pull uh, if you tune up the weather at the airport. So, we're just going to cheat because it's faster. You can see we're at 21 Celsius, and this is also in Celsius. So, we've got our slash, 21. Click it in. At this point, if you wanted to derate the engine to save the lifespan of your digital engines, or to save digital fuel, which costs you nothing, you could click to derate, basically tricking the engine into thinking the temperature is something different and it will basically not fully perform so that you're reducing wear. The main downside to that being um, if the engine is not giving you the most power you're increasing your takeoff roll and you need to account for that before you take off. Which is why when this is not set we could not complete our takeoff screen for V-speeds. So now that that's in there we're going to leave it at the top most that's full power. 26,000 pounds of thrust. We're going to click take off. And this is where we're a moment ago. And now those QRHs are filled in. A V1 speed, that's sort of our not turning back safely point. Uh, there are times when flights or takeoffs have been terminated after V1, but generally speaking, you would need a very good reason to do so because the aircraft is moving quickly enough that you could not expect to safely stop it before the end of the runway. VR is our rotate speed. It's very close to V1 and that's frequently the case with the Zebo. Uh, at that point when we hit V rotate, we are going to raise the nose to about 15 degree up angle here and we can expect to lift off at V2. So I've just been clicking which populated these. The nice thing is now that they are set in the FMC, Zebo has simulated the co-pilot calling those out for us. So if you're flying and you've got your uh, eyes down the runway and you're watching other indications, you don't have to be monitoring that quite as closely because Zebo is going to call off V1, rotate, and V2. All right, at this point, we have set up our FMC, and we are actually ready to go. I'm going to show you two more quick things before we do any movement. I'm going to leave the pilot side in legs, which shows us our current settings. I'm going to jump over here to my co-pilot seat. I'm going to put his or hers to legs. I'm going to move on up here to this ECU, which is our uh, EFIS control unit. And I'm going to scroll this one from map to plan. Now you can mess with the range until you can see what you want to see. I'm going to scroll it out most of the way so that we can see the full flight. Now we're flying mostly a straight line so it doesn't look particularly fascinating but it will help you to see if there are any issues or bizarre things that are happening. Uh, it's also kind of nice when you're flying to leave these both up, one in plan and one in map mode. Alright, other interesting things. I feel like there was another... Oh, it doesn't hurt to run through here using next page and make sure you don't have any disconnects occasionally. I'll just put on our arrival now. Our arrival into LAX is called Iron Man 2. Click next and 
until we see it. There we go, Iron Man 2. I'm just going to execute it without picking a runway. Now let's <laughs> unable cruise altitude. We'll get back to that. Let's go back to legs and scroll through. That's what we're looking for. I'm going to clear that cruise altitude. These little squares, a route discontinuity. This is a problem for you when you get to it. Uh, basically, if we go and look at the co-pilot's display, when you have that disconnect, it is a break in the plan where things are disconnected. So using the step button, when he's in plan mode, we have a step button here, and it allows you to move through the plan one waypoint at a time. You can see we're coming up on that disconnect. You see how it just the world ends burgle. So we can do it from the co-pilots at FMC. We'll click Iron Man. And you can see how it cues it down here in the bottom. And then now beside the blanked out one, we'll click it. And it basically just moves everything up. So we're just sort of restitching the plan back together. We're really just attaching the star, the standard instrument arrival, Iron Man 2, onto our plan. And now that we've done that, once again we need to hit Execute. And now it is officially attached. And let's continue with that step button and you can see it runs us through. Oh, and we've looped our plan back since we didn't set the runway yet. Alright, at this point our FMC is ready for takeoff.